like that. Yeah, you can see it that way. You can use that. Um, last week we looked at events in 1525, uh, the events of Luther's marriage. He had a happy marriage uh, to Katharina von Bora, to the break with Erasmus over doctrine, and uh, to the uh, horrible, horrible Peasants' Revolt of 1525. And Luther never got over that. Probably 100,000 people were killed. Okay, we're moving now, 1525, 26, 27, 28. Things are going along rather well. Um, to 29, 1529. Uh, by this time, we have a number of other churches and evangelists, of preachers, pastors. Well, they really only saw themselves primarily as pastors. We have several, particularly in Switzerland, that have arisen uh, apparently independently of Luther, but teaching the same things. We have particularly Lorik Zwingli in Zurich. Uh, we have John Wickham of Bodies, like Basel, Bayer, places like that, Wolfgang Kapitol. Uh, these are all great reformers. We have Martin Busser. Uh, he's, actually, he's still in Germany, in a part of Germany that today is France, uh, around Strasbourg. He settles in Strasbourg. So we've got a number of others. Now we're going to presume that they're teaching the same thing. Erasmus said, if you ever break away from the church, you'll have continual splits. So far, that, but, but now, now a problem looms on the horizon in 1529. And that is over the communion. There's a lot of arguing among Protestants today over baptism, what it means and the mode of it, and how old you should be and all of that. This was the communion. The Germans call it Abendmahlstreit. Because uh, Abendmahl means communion. Streit is conflict. Because Ulrich Stingley, <coughs> who was a former humanist, like Erasmus. Most of these, as a matter of fact, every one of the other reformers other than Luther was formerly an Erasmian humanist. We talked about Erasmus before, so I won't get into that, but because he's a humanist, he was a humanist, a lot of that kind of stuck with him, with, with Singley in Zurich. Uh, and, and one thing was a suspicion of the flesh. Humanists were much more oriented toward the spirit. So Stingley looked at the sacraments and he said they are symbols only. Uh, some said they were just, Stingley had just naked symbols. They were only symbolic. Uh, so with baptism, it only symbolized our salvation. So with communion, it symbolized the death of Christ. In other words, not means of grace, at all, not anything more than that. When that news got to Luther, he was furious. Because Luther, Luther's view of the communion was similar to the Catholics. He, he believed that transubstantiation, the Catholic doctrine, was priestly magic. So he denied that. But he said, on the other hand, the communion is the body and blood of Christ. Because Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. And it is. And if anybody argued with Luther and said, well, Jesus' body and blood is in heaven, Luther would, and then and how is the, how the body and blood get into the communion, into the elements? And he would say, I don't know. How does fire get into hot iron? You put a hot iron on the stove and touch it, it's, it's hot. It's hot. I don't know how the heat gets there. Now, we might know today by transference of heat, but anyway, that was his answer. It just is. Don't argue with me. <laughs> that was Luther. And so Zwingli was teaching something different as far as Luther was concerned. He was a heretic. 
We've got some seats, got a few seats down here. Uh, you can hear better. Yeah, you can hear better. Come on down and take a jeans one thing. Uh, Bill, do you can take you know, anywhere. <laughs> um, we still got a few. Anyway, I'm glad to see it filled up. Um, well, anyway, this is this is a conflict, and uh, it, it threatened to divide the the church. So Luther declared Zwingli a heretic, and and Zwingli wouldn't change, and Luther wouldn't change. So Martin Bucer. Uh, and Philip Melanchthon, who was the right-hand man of Luther in, in Wittenberg, decided we've got to do something. They were, of course, afraid of the theological division that would follow, the church being the, the Protestant church, as it would. I can't use that word yet. I'll tell you the minute when we start using it. But the, the, being divided up. And the, the princes were concerned about the political ramifications because the emperor is adamant. He's, he's really very much, he was determined to stamp out this heresy, as he called it. Uh, I was finishing a book on, on Martin and Katarina uh, yesterday, and what he did right after Luther died was just horrible in trying to stamp it out. Uh, he didn't. I'll tell you that he finally just gave up and threw in the towel and, and abdicated and went off to a monastery in Spain. <laughs> but until he did that in 1555, uh, he, he was ferocious. So uh, the, the princes said they'll use a divide and conquer technique on us. And we've got to stay together. Now particularly, uh, I've got three chairs down front. And you're, any, anybody wants to come down is most okay, most welcome. I love people on the front row. So, uh, and there's one chair there. Um, we got several there for different points. Okay, uh, but it's it's wonderful to have this problem. I, I have this many people. Very good. So uh, Philip of Hesse. Philip of Hesse is the key man. Uh, Hesse um, is a district in Germany, and his castle was at Marburg. Anybody been there? You have. Good for you. You've been there? Okay. I've been there. And it's thrilling. It's Marburg on the lawn. It, it, the room looks just as it did. Anyway, Philip of Hesse offered his castle. And Martin Bucer and Philip Melanchthon worked together to put together, a, you might say, a meeting, a debate. It's called the Marburg Colloquy. It's 1529. And when that meeting took place between Spingley and Martin Luther, there were 18 leaders of this new, what we call, Protestant movement. 18 of them, the, the, the main people. I mean, it's just in one room, the gathering of, of the primary leaders of the Reformation. They were there. And there's a picture that was painted, and it's hanging today in that room. I went in that room. It looks just as it did in that picture. It was just absolutely thrilling. So the, the meeting took place in 1529. And Zwingli debated eloquently his position. This is just symbolic uh, of the body and blood of Christ. It, it represents it, uh, but we don't look to it for any more than that. And as he was talking, Luther just started writing on the tablecloth. Now, there's some controversy. Some say he lifted up the tablecloth and wrote on the table. R.C. Sproul says he had a little tiny chalkboard, he wrote on that. <laughs> but you'll see that the painting in the room has the writing on the, a red tablecloth. But he wrote the words, Hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, because that's what the priest says when he elevates the host in the mass, Hoc est corpus meum. 
and he just pointed to it. And as Spengley went on talking, he was pointing to what he wrote. In other words, Jesus said, this is my body, that settled it. Well, Busser, who was working so hard to, to get Luther to see a middle position, put his hand out. Now, many of the historians say it was, it was Zwingli who did that. My sources, when I did he said, can't we still be brothers and, and in fellowship with each other? And Luther would not, I mean, Luther would not take his hand and said, you have a different spirit. It's interesting, I was reading just yesterday that a letter he wrote to his wife, they called her Sir Katie, my Lord Katie. He called, oh, he, he gave her the most elegant titles. He just adored Katie. He said the nicest things about his wife. It's just a good example for all of us husbands. Uh, and, and he wrote back to her and he said, I, I don't want any more of this brother and fellowship business when, when they won't accept the obvious biblical truth. He really just thought they, they were wrong. So it, it was a disaster. It did not work out well. And Zwingli knew he was in trouble. And later, Zwingli had to take the, the field to defend militarily against the southern cantons in Switzerland, which were Catholic. And, and he was killed in 1531 at the Battle of Capel. Uh, and Heinrich Bullinger succeeded him in, in, in Zurich. Zurich continued as a reformed church. Philip of Hesse and the other princes got ready for the inevitable. Meanwhile, boosters wouldn't quit. He said, I've got to find a middle ground that all of them will agree to. And he had the Wittenberg Concord drawn up, which eventually he, he got Luther to sign. Luther shed tears and he said, I've been wrong. I've wronged you, Martin. But at any rate, they were working for this middle ground. Now Luther backed away from it. And as I understand the Lutherans today, uh, still hold to Luther's position, which is called consubstantiation. The Catholic position is transubstantiation, that the elements change into the literal body and blood of Christ. Luther's position is consubstantiation. The elements are just body and blood just with it. But Boozer kept working for that middle ground, which he thought would represent the biblical truth, which I think most of us would agree with Boozer. And so he came up with what he called the doctrine of the spiritual presence. And he said, I can, I can say truthfully that this is the true body and true blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper, but it is spiritual and not literal. The literal body and blood of Christ is in heaven. This is spiritual. And thus it becomes a means of grace. Any of you who have served communion here know that normally the pastors say when we serve you communion or you say to us when you serve us communion body of christ this is the body of christ this is the blood of christ what does that say the reformed community came to believe it is the body and blood of christ but in a spiritual sense the reformed community came to accept Booser's definition and remember Booser was john calvin's teacher he Calvin was his protege. I must insist that everybody realize that, that, that Busser was the, the mentor, and Calvin, when he was younger, tagged along with Busser everywhere he went, and he picked up this doctrine, and it now becomes. So we have four doctrines of the communion, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, the symbolic only doctrine of singly, and the spiritual presence doctrine of the reformed community. Does anybody have any questions on that? That's 1529 that that definition was developed. And you thank Martin Luther for that. Uh, the same year, the emperor had a break in the wars. He's fighting a war with France. It's called the habsburg Valois Wars, and there were probably about uh, four different segments to it. And every now and there's an intermission there's a truce, a peace that's signed, and, and the emperor's got time. He says, this is where I'm going to stamp out these people. So uh, he had planned a, a diet, a meeting at uh, Spire, S-P-E-Y-E-R, 
earlier, but the war interrupted it. So he has a break again in 1529, that same year as the Marburg Colloquy. And he called the um, reform group or the Lutheran group together uh, and expire for this diet, this meeting. And he said to them, uh, I want you to, for, I want you to stop. Of course, he wanted them just to quit. He wanted the, all this heresy to stop. But one thing they were doing that was particularly annoying Charles, Charles V is the emperor. They were confiscating church land. As an area became Protestant, the Protestants would take over the land. Now remember that the Catholic Church owned 50% of all land in Europe. 50%. And vast amount of farmland, vast amount of territory, especially the monasteries. And as the monasteries dissolved, all that huge amount of land that they controlled uh, was now taken over by the, the state or by the, 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 the evangelical church. So stop it. Stop seizing the land of the church. Uh, I'm, I'm demanding that. And the, the princes said, we protest. And so the Catholics, in derision, called them Protestants. The people who protest. Did you all know that? You got the name Protestant from a meeting in which the emperor said, stop seizing church land. And they said, we protest. So they're called Protestants. So if anybody asks you, what are you protesting? Originally it was the emperor's command to stop seizing church land. But now they become known as Protestants. Now I can use that term. And, and Charles said also, will you please tell me what you people believe? So draw up some confession of faith. And they said, okay, we'll do that. And they turned to the, the best systematic theologian among them, and that's Philip Melanchthon. Luther was not. I have to say, Bucer was not. But Philip Melanchthon was. And the other good systematic theologian, of course, was John Calvin. And that's a special talent to be able to do that. So Melanchthon, though he didn't dry up a complete statement of faith as Calvin did in the Institute, but he drew up a, a, a a confession to present to the emperor. And he showed it first to the princes. And the princes said, good, we can sign that. We all agree, this could be the confession for our territory. You know, Germany was many Germanies. It, it was so until 1870. So it, it, we'll do this in Saxony, we'll do this in Mecklenburg, we'll do this in, in Prussia, what, you know, we'll accept it. And so they said, we'll sign it. And Melanchthon said, no. My lords, please, I think only theologians should sign it. And the princes said, well, we're going to sign it. Well, Melanchthon was wrong. They were right because they needed the political support of those princes. So there was a unanimous political statement, and they signed it. The next year, 1530, the emperor called them together at Augsburg. And... He said to them first, well, they showed him the confession. They showed him what, here's here, your majesty, here's what we brought it up. You ask us to draw up a confession, here's our confession. He took a look at it and he said, stop it, stop it. Stop this heresy immediately. All of you stop it. And the princess said, we don't intend to stop it. I command you to stop it, said Charles. You can command our bodies. You cannot command our consciences. And one of them stepped forth and said, before we deny our beliefs, we will let you, and he knelt down, and there was this raised platform, a dais. He knelt down, bared his neck, and stretched it out on that platform. And he said, before we deny our faith, we'll let you strike off, please strike off my head. And then one by one, the princes in the room came forward, knelt down, and did the same thing. Now the emperor looked at that. He had no choice. 
if he cut their heads off, it would be his head cut off. I mean, this was the board of directors that hired him. These were the people to whom he's accountable. Uh, there would have been a, an uprising against him. He knew that. So he said, well, let me see that confession. And he approved it. And Luther was startled. He never thought that would happen. He told Katie, well, it's, Katie, we've had a wonderful marriage. I've loved you. But he thought he was going to die. And, and then came the news. The emperor approved the confession. That is the Augsburg Confession of Faith, and it's the only confession of faith Lutherans have ever had. That's 1529, 1530, I'm sorry, 1530. Well, any questions about that? Uh, the 30s, and really what, what happens is in any Lutheran territory, the Lutherans have freedom for the time being. Now the emperor's not through. As I said, he's going to try to squash them. He's going to try to end it. And he tried very hard right after Luther died uh, until he finally had realized it wasn't going to work and he, he abdicated. But the 1530s, as best I can tell, were pretty good years for Luther. He was having, he and Katie were having children. They had six children. They adopted four more. That means ten. The, the prince uh, gave them, by this time it, it, is, it is John, uh, the elector of Saxony, gave the Luthers the black cloister, the Wittenberg cloister, there in, in Wittenberg, uh, to live, and, and Katie came in and fixed it up. It was all disheveled and broken down, and everything was a mess. And she came in, took over. She's a strong woman. She's well organized. She knows what she's doing. She had that place. She went out and got the whitewash and whitewashed the walls herself. And then she started planting gardens and raising cattle and pigs and all that, you know. So she just takes over. Luther was blessed to have this woman. Uh, and they have six children. And and Luther adores them. His oldest son is Hans. There's Hans and Martin and Paul. And, and then they had three girls. Uh, one died in infancy. That hurt him. What really hurt him was uh, Magdalena. He called her Lena. And, and she was 13 and she died of a disease and it just broke his heart and Katarina's. But for the most part, and that was in the 40s, so the 30s were, were good years. Luther. By the time we get down to the 40s, Luther's health is breaking down. Uh, he uh, was then younger than many of us are today, but things were different back then. People didn't live as long. And uh, of course, Lena's death hurt him. Uh, the breaking away of the Anabaptists. Uh, Heard him, of course, Karl Stott and Thomas Munster left him, and a couple, Grable and Mons from, from, from Zurich. So the, the Anabaptists, we won't go into that, but they, they don't have any clear central teaching and organization, and, and neither do they follow the, the scriptures as authority, it's what they feel in their hearts. Uh, the break with Erasmus hurt him. He never got over the Peasants' Revolt. He thought, he blamed himself for the Peasants' Revolt. And, and, he, and he really hoped, and I know many of you heard this, what I'm about to say, he had hoped that when he presented the clear gospel and how simple it is and how wonderful it is, that the Jews would all convert. They didn't. So he, he reacted. And by this time, he's, he's getting pretty peevish. <laughs> And, and somewhat depressed. Anyway, he reacted with a horrible denunciation of the Jews, which Hitler used against the Jews in World War II. We can't get around the fact that he wrote it, but uh, Melanchthon is taking over more and more at that time. Uh, he was depressed about the fact of the Marburg Colloquy and the fact that not all Protestants accepted his doctrine of, of communion. Um, he he loved his children, uh, 
that much. And Lenny still was preaching and trying and doing what he could, but he was physically breaking down. He had to be carried around in a wagon. He couldn't walk very well. So, uh, 1546 is the year of his death. He had not been to Eisleben since he was six months old. He was born in Eisleben. His, his dad left when he was six months old. And uh, there were two brothers in Eisleben who were having a problem. They were feuding with each other. And they begged him to come back and settle the quarrel. And Katie didn't want him to go. You're not up to it. Don't go. Well, oh, Katie, I can go. I can handle it. I want to go back anyway. That's where I was born. And she didn't go with him, and he went. And he wrote to her nearly every day. The letters are so tender. But he would simply say, Katie, don't worry. Quit worrying. Uh, you know, I'm fine. I'll be okay. I'll be back home soon. And Katie knew better. But she held on to hope. Uh, and uh, he preached there uh, in St. Andreas Church. Uh, his last sermon, he said, his text was Matthew 11. Come unto me, all you that we are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart. And he said to the church, the congregation, I feel rather weak today. But I believe I will be better next week. But he didn't make it to next week. Thursday, he died. Uh, and his, his boys were there to see him, to be with him at the last. And of course, Katie was heartbroken. And it was then that the emperor began to react. Um, and Melanchthon <clears throat> walked into his classroom and said, a prince and a great man has, has died. In Israel, we lost it today, using a quote from the Bible. It was a very sad time, but the movement survived. I mean, here we are today, the movement survived. Um, one thing, what did Luther, <coughs> what did Luther believe at this point? What, when he died, what did he believe? And by the way, uh, the Catholics had what they call, one of the sacraments was the extreme unction, and they would have a priest come in and anoint you, and they would pray for you before you died. The Protestants began a new tradition, and they had to begin a lot of new traditions. And this tradition was simply to say, do you hold to what you, what you believe, what you confess? Do you still believe it? And Luther said, yes. Uh, he believed in the theology of the cross. Everything is centered about the cross. And we're people going to require so. I will just say, of course, faith only, the five solas, things that we believe so much, not the, the, the theology of glory. Any questions? How old was he when he died? 63. Younger than you and I are. Uh, the church paid him, uh, and the, the prince looked after him. Yes, he really had, he had enough money. Yes, he was well provided for, and he provided for Katie. Uh, there was some confusion after he died as to who would have control of his estate and, and the children, uh, and uh, it eventually worked out pretty well. He inherited from his father. He inherited some of his father was wealthy, yes. Any other questions? So much more, but we'll, we'll need to stop there. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you and praise you uh, for the people who have stood for truth and for the gospel through the years, uh, always to give you glory, to give you the glory, not to give us the glory. And we thank you that our brother Martin Luther understood that and taught that as the main core teaching of his life, that we don't try to take glory to ourselves. We give glory to you because it is all grace and mercy. And we thank you. Be with us as we worship today. We ask in Christ's name. Thank you all.